On the next episode of Probably True Solar Stories, we continue part four of The Solar Heist, or How I Got Into the Solar Business. Maz and Charlie are forced by a mob boss to dig up some cats, an acronym for certain awful things. But as they dig, an unexpected visitor arrives to give Charlie a pop quiz. Will Charlie pass the test? Solar friends and solar fiction lovers, huzzah, the La La music is back, and that means we've returned for season two of Probably True Solar Stories. If you missed season one, shame, shame, shame. Please catch up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at probablytruesolar.com. I'm your host and solar storyteller, Tor Solar Fred Valenza. A long time ago, I used to write for Hollywood. Then I decided to use my creative communication skills to promote and educate people about solar energy. As part of that mission, I created Probably True Solar Stories. So why solar fiction? Well, why the hell not? I mean, why lawyer stories or dragon stories? In any case, it's a creative way to educate consumers about solar. It also helps new solar job seekers to become familiar with the solar industry and its various careers. There are over 3 million solar installations in the U.S. and around 260,000 or so solar workers. We never see those solar people or solar workers on film and TV shows today, and that sucks. As I hope you'll see from Season 2, solar stories can be just as thrilling and fun as any John Grisham lawyer story, especially when you can make shit up. And that's what I'm going to do. Although I do include true solar takeaways in every episode. With all that in mind, let's start Season 2. La 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 la, oh, oh, la 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 la. If you missed the teaser episode, the theme of this season is solar noir. It's like the film noir genre, except with solar. If you're a fan of Coen Brother movies, that's the tone for this episode and for most of season two. The other thing that I highly recommend before listening to this first episode is to listen to the last episode of season one. Then you'll be caught up on this ongoing solar heist storyline. As with season one, we're going to have a total of three episodes dedicated to the solar heist. Two right now, and one for episode 10, our season finale. Then starting with episode three, we'll have six more standalone original solar fiction stories. As for the heist storyline, when we last left Maz and Charlie we found out that Charlie is an undercover FBI agent who's about to bust Richard Prout, the Solar Project's owner, for murders and for burying the bodies under the Solar Project. Surprise! Your best friend is a rat. Now that you're caught up, roll that Lala music. The Solar Heist, or How I Got Into the Solar Business, Part 4, The Warning. Written and read by Tor Solar Fred Valenza. Okay, here we go. Connections are weird. How you meet people, what they do to your life, you never understand in the moment. It's only when you look back that you see if your connection screwed up your life or saved you. At that time, I wasn't sure about Charlie. There we were, me. Charlie, and an excavator in the middle of a field of solar panels at one o'clock in the morning. I looked around to make sure Richie hadn't followed us or set up a sniper, but it just seemed to be me and Charlie, my new FBI friend. I just couldn't believe it. FBI guys are tough. They're built, and they don't know solar engineering and environmental permitting. Charlie was built like a garden hose, long, thin, and floppy. And FBI agents, they don't go out with your wife and slurp ramen and tear up at the movies. Plus, if Charlie wasn't a real solar geek, what about Beth? Was she an undercover fed, too? Over the last year, Beth and my Pauline, they'd been like sisters. They'd do nail spas and shop at Berkeley Bowl together. Were Charlie and Beth even really married? They sure seemed like it. And what about our friendship? I went legit into the solar business because of him. Did Charlie and Beth move across the street to set me up with his solar ice so that I'd have to testify against Richard Prout? Before I made any fight or flight decisions, I had to know. Charlie, 
Who the fuck are you? I just told you, Maz, I'm the rat. Shh. Let's not talk about it here. Let's dig up our cats so that I can get pictures of the bodies, get some DNA, yada yada yada, and have my team arrest Richard Prout in the morning. Case closed. I don't believe you. What's not to believe? I don't believe you're an FBI agent, Charlie. You're a solar nerd. You slurp ramen. You tear up at movies. You think I fake tearing up at a man called Otto? Besides, there's nothing in the FBI training model that says that we can't slurp and tear up. Huh. <sighs> Jeez, Maz, I thought you could have handled it. I shouldn't have told you. Yes, you should have told me. A long time ago you should have told me. Before I started my own solar business thanks to you. First, you love the solar business. Second, I stopped you from committing more felonies. You're welcome. That's not the point. If I was going to go legit, I wanted to go, you know, legit. Not start a business and then go into the witness protection program. You won't have to, Maz. This is so big, we're going to catch everybody involved. And all the way to the top. It's all connected. We're connected. In a good way, my friend. You'll see. But not now. We've got to dig up these cats, or else Richard might get suspicious. So please, use that big, beautiful excavator and dig. We'll talk later. Charlie pointed to the excavator's toothy yellow shovel, and I got into the cab and fired up the engine. As I dug, Charlie seemed calm, watching the hole for any signs of our buried cats. Occasionally, he'd wave his hand, making sure I didn't smack one of the solar panels hanging off the tracker. They were parked horizontal, so I didn't have a lot of room to maneuver. On the ground next to the excavator were my bullets from when Charlie had told me to empty my Luger. I could load up again and probably shoot Charlie before he got too far, but if I wanted to go that route, it would be better if it looked like an accident. Then I thought, maybe I could use the excavator shovel to whack Charlie unconscious, run home, grab Pauline, and then disappear. But if Charlie really was FBI and not just an FBI rat, the feds wouldn't stop until they found me. And then again, Proud would also send his dogs after me. I had to choose a side. Two things made me lean towards Charlie. One, if he really was FBI, then Pauline and I could go into a witness protection program. Two, I liked the son of a bitch. And I didn't particularly like Richard Prout, who, let's face it, hired me to move dumpsters filled with certain awful things. So I kept digging and hoping that Charlie knew what he was doing. But when I think back on it now, I don't think he did. I dug a ten-foot hole, but there was still no sign of the buried cats. Staring down into the pit, Charlie waved me to stop, and I cut the engine. I don't think there's anything here, Moss. You sure you got the right coordinates? Charlie checked his phone and nodded. Since the solar project was built on a landfill and we'd broken the cap, a strong rotten egg smell came out of the pit. Christ, that smells. Maybe the bodies are just composted. Charlie shined his phone's flashlight into the pit. And then we heard Richie's voice. Need some help, gentlemen? A six-foot-five, lanky, twenty-five-year-old wearing a Berkeley hoodie stepped out from behind one of the trackers. I knew him. I called him Richie three times, because you never wanted to see him more than twice. He wanted his nickname to be Richie Berkeley, because he graduated from Cal and played on the basketball team for a year. But in our world, nobody cared about where you went to college, your GPA, or your three-pointers. All we cared about was not being maimed or shot by the shithead with the Berkeley hoodie. I saw half of a Glock G19 9mm hanging out of the kangaroo front pocket of Richie's hoodie sweatshirt. I forced a smile. Hey, Richie. Hello, Mr. Botticelli. Mr. Boston. And you are? asked Charlie, seeing the butt of Richie's Glock. Well, Mr. Botticelli refers to me as Richie three times. It's a nickname I dislike, so you can just call me Richie or Richie Berkeley. I went to school there. Impressive, said Charlie. I'm Stanford. Is Berkeley where you learn to shoot that gun? Oh no, Mr. Boston. For guns, knives, and breaking legs, I'm self-taught. It's been quite an education, but I feel like an infinite learner. Richie casually pulled out his Glock. What shall we learn today? Hmm. I think I'd like to learn about bullet wounds and kneecaps. Wait, 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 I said. I got out of the excavator, and Richie pointed the clock at me. Get back into the excavator, Mr. Botticelli. I'm talking to Mr. Boston. 
only, and I'm listening, Charlie said. As instructed by Mr. Prout, we were just trying to find some previously buried cats. Maybe you're the cat, Mr. Boston, and Mr. Botticelli just dug your grave with his excavator. So sad, said Richie. I don't understand. Richard gave us this map to pick up these cats and deliver them to another location. We have no problem with that, do we, Moz? So why the threats? Because Mr. Prout thinks that this whole solar investment scheme has smelled as rotten as this landfill, especially since your procured solar panels got confiscated by U.S. Customs. That was my exporter. He switched the ethically manufactured panels with panels made from slave labor. That wasn't my fault, said Charlie. Maybe, but then Mr. George Dextry, Mr. Prout's messenger service, he disappeared, and he's suddenly talking to the FBI. You talked a lot to Mr. Dextry, Mr. Boston. As this project's lead developer, I talk to everyone, Richie. That's my job. So I still don't understand why I'm being threatened. Because somebody's a rat, Mr. Boston, and Mr. Prout thinks it's you. Mr. Botticelli has a history for discretion. He's never been trouble. The devil you know, as they say. Charlie held up his hands, frustrated more than scared. Okay, Richie, let me tell you what I know. I know that Richard Prout is the owner of this landfill. That's a public record. I know that capped landfills are great for building solar projects. I know that this landfill was almost full two years ago, and that Mr. Prout still wanted to make money. That's when I met him. Thanks to me, utilities are going to pay Mr. Prout a steady income for 30 years for every kilowatt hour this project generates. On top of that, I know that his company is going to get a bonus 20% tax credit for building the project on a brownfield near disadvantaged communities for a total 50% tax credit. Finally, I know that my solar panel exporter screwed us, and that's when Richard told me to contact Moz to heist the solar panels out of customs. I had no idea about cats or bodies or buried dumpsters until a half hour ago. What else do you know that I don't know, Richie? Can you share, please? I'd prefer that you not school me about solar economics, Mr. Boston. Richie pointed to the Berkeley logo on his sweatshirt. What I know is that Mr. Prout says that you're the rat. He didn't cite his sources. Now, I'm going to give you an oral exam about your involvement with the FBI. If you confess quickly, I won't kill your white theft. If you fake your answers, I will kill her. And then you two can be buried in this smelly dump together. I will allow you two fake answers. And now you know why we call you Richie three times, I said. Shut it, Maz. Mr. Boston, would you like to confess or bullshit me two more times? It'll be less painful if you give me the right answers now. Charlie didn't say anything. I could tell he was thinking about a way out, but I didn't see one. Charlie, listen to me, buddy. You can deny it twice, but he will start in on you on the third time. Tell him what you know. At least save Beth. I'll make sure Richie keeps his word. Richie turned the gun toward me. You can't make me do anything, Mr. Botticelli. If I feel like taking a piss on Mr. Boston's wife or slam dunking Mr. Boston's severed head on my private basketball court, you're going to stay in the audience and watch. Or would you and Mrs. Botticelli like to become cats too? Sit down, Mr. Botticelli. I won't tell you again. I knew he meant it. I sat back down on the excavator and looked at Charlie. Fine, if you won't tell him for Beth's sake, I will. Richie, Charlie is the rat. But he's more than a rat, Richie. He's FBI. If you fire one shot, ten agents are going to bust through the gates right now. Nice try, Maz. I won't count that as Mr. Boston's first denial. Anything truthful you want to say, Mr. Boston? Beth is counting on you. I'm not FBI. I'm not the rat. I'm just a solar developer. Stop making shit up, Moz. It's not helping me, and it won't help Beth. One, counted Richie. Charlie was desperate. He fell to his knees in front of Richie, tearing up, his two hands covering his head. Please don't shoot me. Please don't shoot my wife. I'm just a solar developer. Please. Two, Mr. Boston. Be careful what you say next, or my lesson will begin by shooting your kneecap. Charlie continued crying, his face dripping with snot. This was no fucking FBI agent. I tried to think of a way to help him, but Richie was staring at me, warning me. 
Charlie, buddy, don't do this to Beth. Tell him what you know, please, Charlie, for her. Okay, okay. Oh, God, oh, God. Charlie wiped off a long string of mucus from his nose. He was still balled up, protecting his head. Then he sat up straight, and suddenly he grabbed Richie by his knees. It was a savvy move by Charlie. Maybe he was FBI. At 6'5", Richie's arms flailed like a Ferris wheel, trying to keep his balance, and then the gun flew out of his hand without him firing. Richie fell straight down and hit the soft, muddy crown with a thwack. Immediately, he looked for the gun, which had landed ten feet in front of the two of them. It became a tough mutter, crawl and claw race for the gun. I knew I couldn't get to the Glock before one of them, but I did have the excavator. I turned it on. Richie looked over his shoulder to see me and the excavator coming towards them. He stretched his basketball player arms closer to the clock. To slow him down, Charlie got a grip on Richie's hoodie, trying to pull him back. It was a good idea, but Richie just towed Charlie's beanpole body forward. Charlie tried to dig the tips of his feet into the mud, but they just made straight goopy lines in the dirt. The good news was that I was almost there. My plan was to crush Richie's fucking head three times with the shovel. But that didn't happen. When I raised the shovel, Richie saw it coming, and he knew he had one last chance. He lunged and got both his hands gripped on the clock. Then he turned over and toward me to shoot. At the same time, I let the shovel down. But instead of hitting his head like I wanted, the sawtooth shovel came down short and chopped off both of Richie's hands at the wrist while he was holding the gun. You have to know that I didn't mean to make Richie suffer like he did. I wanted to do it clean, bang, down on the head. But Mr. Berkeley was not so smart about dying peacefully. He wasn't giving up. He still wanted to fight. Charlie let go of his hoodie and stood up. But Richie, he stayed on the ground and tried to pick up the gun with his gushing bloody stubs. Almost as bad were his groans. It was like he'd lost his language. All he could do was grunt scream in agony and frustration, like a baby groaning for a toy that's just been taken away. He made that sound and kept trying to pick up the clock with his stubs, even though his severed hands were right in front of him. First, he tried to use his right stub to pick up his right hand, as if it would magnetically reattach itself. But of course, he just ended up shoving his right hand forward. Then he tried to use both his stubs to pick up the right hand, and that actually worked. He was lying on the ground and pointing the Glock at Charlie. By then, Charlie was on his feet, but he didn't flinch. Charlie knew that Richie had no way to pull the trigger. Plus, there was so much blood, Richie couldn't hold it in his hand for long, and it slipped to the ground again. <coughs> and this is another reason why I couldn't believe Charlie really was an FBI agent. Even knowing that Richie was going to kill him and Beth, he was still compassionate. Richie said, Charlie, I think you've got to let us get you to a hospital before you bleed to death. <coughs> Charlie bent down and picked up Richie's right hand with the clock and plied off the gun from the fingers. He stuffed it behind his back. We've got to stop that bleeding, Richie. Stand up. Let me give you a... Oh, God. I'm sorry. I swear I didn't mean to. Yeah, Charlie didn't mean to say what he almost said, but before Charlie could step away holding his hand out, Richie stood up and punched Charlie in the chin with his bloody sausage wrist. If Richie had a fist, it would have been a good hit. But in this circumstance, it hurt Richie more than Charlie. <coughs> Richie immediately pulled back, shaking his arm as if it had fallen asleep. Charlie moved towards him, still holding Richie's right hand. Richie, I swear, I do want to get you and your hands to the hospital. Maybe they can... And that's when Richie stepped back from Charlie and fell into the pit that was meant for cats. Certain awful things. He'd lost a lot of blood, but he wasn't dead yet. Lying on his back, Richie looked up at us, his handless arms twitching, and then something switched. He spoke with real words. He said, Mr. Prout, he's nobody. 
wait till you fuckheads meet the real solar project owner. Richie three times closed his eyes, twitched his elbows like a final double drum beat, and then his shoulders relaxed. Charlie went over and picked up Richie's left hand, then he went down into the pit. Gently, he placed Richie's two hands next to his wrists. Charlie, I said, what, Maz? Other way. Charlie looked back at Richie's body and realized he'd put Richie's left hand next to the right wrist and vice versa. Damn it! Can this night get any more fucked? The short answer, yes, it could and it would. <laughs> Well, that was violent in a very Coen Brothers kind of way, but safe stories are boring stories. Probably True Solar Stories is about making solar a part of today's pop culture. And what are we all watching on film and television and video games today? Spies and assassins who shoot to kill. Cops and detectives who discover ugly corpses. Monsters and zombies that eat flesh. Terrorists who blow up buildings. Dragons and orcs that burn, maim, and kill. That being said, most of the stories in Season 2 are just exciting stories. They're funny stories, but they're not all violent stories, but they do have action. I hope that by the end of Season 2, people won't just learn more about solar through contextual fiction. They'll also see how solar can be as dark and as sexy and funny as any other story on the big or little screens. That's all for now. I know I left you with a cliffhanger, so come on back for Part 5 of The Solar Heist or how I got into the solar business. After that, we'll take a break from the solar heist and move to more exciting and funny solar stories. The Solar Heist, or How I Got Into the Solar Business, was written and read by Tor Solar Fred Melenza. Please remember to subscribe, like, and review the show on Apple, Spotify, and your favorite streaming services. Probably True Solar Stories is a production of Unthink Solar PR and Communications. Be bold for solar. Stand out and educate. Thanks again for listening. See you next time. Mm-hmm.